in my lab is thinking about how we can use all of the data that have been accumulating over the last 30 or so years for phylogeographic studies. We have done lots of you know, studies in the particular focal systems in my lab, and there's thousands of labs across the world that do this. And it's very common for us to do a study, answer some question about a specific species, and then move on. Right? And so one of the reasons I'm interested in this is if you do literature searches, what you realize very quickly is that there are a large number of papers that have been published since 1987 when John Avis and colleagues came up with this phrase, phylogeography. And so this is a plot of publications by year. Um, phylogeography is not cratering right now. This is a lag time effect that it takes a while to get these citation metrics into Web of Science where I did this search. And so there's a lot of papers that have been published collectively. Every year we have more and more. These are all really potentially useful data for people who are interested in biodiversity questions. And, and what we're really trying to do is figure out how to use these data in larger analyses. I think this is justified because if you then track how many times these papers are getting cited, what you see is this shape where most papers don't get cited very much, and then there's a few papers that are getting cited a lot. And so the papers that tend to get cited a lot, not surprisingly, are first of all, papers that describe methods that everyone uses. So like uh, the TCS paper, which was you know, 10, 15 years ago, everyone used this program. The BEAST paper you know, is catching up. The second group that's sort of well represented here are review papers by the leading people in the field. And so, you know, the papers by John Avis and Godfrey Hewitt and others like them. And then there are the rest of our papers, right? <laughs> and this is where my papers end up. They're in this part with everyone else's papers where they're being cited a few times, the data sets are being used once or twice, and then they go on GenBank and presumably they sit there. And so I feel bad for these data sets and I want to use them again. And so we're doing this because there's not, these aren't being used that much, and we're paying a lot for these data. Funding agencies have paid collectively millions and millions and millions of dollars for them. And so what we're thinking about is this is an immense amount of data that are available. So a few years ago, Ryan Garrick's lab in my lab did this sort of literature review, and we estimated that the typical phylogeography paper collects something like 200 alleles. So this is either you know, from 200 individuals in a single locus or from smaller numbers of individuals in multi-locus, but on average, 200 alleles. So these are lots of data points. If we think that maybe three quarters of these phylogeography papers are data papers, this is something like six million data points that should exist. And that's a lot, collectively, a lot of data. So what we're doing in my lab is we're building bioinformatics pipelines that allow us to go to different places and bring all these data together so that we can then analyze them in the common framework. And when you look at how much, how many, how many data sets are available on places like GBIT and GenBank, you know, there's an immense amount of data. There's an immense amount of species occurrence records. And it's not necessarily easy to bring them all together, but I think it's worth trying. And when we started looking into, you know, there's millions of occurrence records on GBIT, so millions of sequences on GenBank. This is an underutilized resource for the kinds of questions that we're in all interested in. And so my, my postdoc, Tara Peltier, has built now a bioinformatics pipeline that pulls data down from various places, formats it in a way that we can use it and aligns it so that we can then have these data sets and develop analyses in the R statistical package to answer all sorts of questions. So basically anything that we can do for an individual species in R, we can potentially do for all of the species in R. And I find this really exciting and potentially really important. So what I'm going to do today is set a world record for the most number of isolation by distance analyses presented in a talk. I think. Guinness is not here, but as far as I can tell, we have data from about 18,000 species. And we're going to think about if we can identify the factors that form isolation by distance using these data. So why IBD? Isolation by distance is a really important idea in population genetics. It's of course this idea that there's a correlation between how separated individuals are geographically and how genetically distant they are. So Sewell Wright mentioned this you know, during the new modern synthesis. Um, it's thought that isolation by distance is an important um, process in leading to population genetic structure. And when species are structured genetically, then things like local adaptation happen, sometimes things like speciation happen. So this is a good first step to try to get into this. So to take you through this, um, 
how we're going to present our results is we're going to have a series of different taxonomic groups. The analyses that were done, so this is essentially the number of data sets that were available, and then the proportion of these at a 0.05 level that were significant. And then finally, because Bonferroni, right, is going to roll over in his grave if I do 18,000 analyses without addressing multiple comparisons in some way, what we did is we did, um, I'm going the wrong direction. we did an exact binomial test to ask the question, is the proportion of species that we find to be isolated by distance greater than we would expect from chance? And so this is just based on a binomial distribution. This is also tested at P equals 0.05. But it allows us to interpret our results in a way that hopefully accounts for the number of comparisons that we're doing without just dividing 0.05 by 18,000 and not being able to say anything. Okay, so let's take a look at what these look like. Again, groups are in this first column here. And we ended up doing something like 21,000 analyses because for some species there were more than one locus available and we just went ahead and did an IBD analysis on each locus independently. And so what we find when we do this is that the proportion of species that exhibit isolation by distance is not really consistent across these different taxonomic groups. Some groups, it's relatively high, like mammals. Other groups, it's relatively low. In some cases, this is because we just don't have a lot of samples. But in other cases, where we do have a lot of samples, these numbers are low. Okay. So based on our exact binomial test, what we find is that all of these animal groups have a number of species that are isolated by, have isolation by genetic distance that's much greater than we would expect by chance. And in the non-animal groups, we don't see this. So when we got these results, we were both glad to see that there was a striking difference. And of course, the next question we wanted to ask is, well, why is this the case? And what we really need to do then is to think about all of the different kinds of life history traits and environmental traits that these species might have and try to find the ones that are actually predicting whether or not we observe isolation by distance. And this is challenging and Ariadna and Tara are both extremely good at, at statistics and thinking about statistics and we've been able to sort of come up with a strategy for addressing this question that synthesizes all of these data. And the reason we're doing this is because in my lab we were sort of not focused in any way but organismally in particular we work on a bunch of different species and we want to compare these species in these bigger analyses and, and see what's going on and what, what are causing these patterns. So we first took all of these isolation by distance analyses that we did and we separated them into two groups. The group of species where we did see isolation by distance and then the group that we didn't. And so we have these categorical um, divisions. So we have a group, you know, two different groups of species. We then use machine learning to try to build the models that will allow us to predict if a species displays isolation by distance. In order to do this machine learning step, we needed to build a data table that contains general information about all these different organisms and their environment. Of course, if you have a bunch of really wide taxonomic range, it's harder and harder to get meaningful data into a data table. And so this was a challenge. We ended up with 33 different variables that we can include in this random forest analysis. Some of these variables are environmental. These are things that are properties of the abiotic environment that the organisms live in, like canopy cover, or whether it's wetland, or whether it's a particular type of habitat. Some of these characteristics are intrinsic to the organism itself. So things like their taxonomy, the kind of metabolism that they have, or the type of gene that we were using. Others were things that the three of us really argued about. Because on the one hand, something like the maximum latitude that a species gets to seems like an extrinsic characteristic. But it's, of course, also something that species are adapting and evolving into temperature regimes and physiologically to deal with that. So really, this third category are interactions between traits that are intrinsic to the organism and extrinsic to the environment. So these are our three categories. We then use random forest, which is an ensemble learning method. And this basically works by building decision trees that include all of these variables and try to predict whether or not a species should be in one category or the other. It's called random forest because you actually end up using a very large number of trees and then you use the modal tree that you're sampling a lot as a good predictor. You also use training data here, so rather than all of the data, you use a subset and then you do your analysis on the complete data set. So in order to interpret this, what we're going to do is look at variable importance by measuring the predictive performance that these uh, variables have. So if you take a variable out, 
then we can measure how the performance of the predictive model changes. And when you get um, a decrease in accuracy that's very large, this implies that a variable is important in predicting the effect that you're looking for. On the other hand, if you take a variable out and it doesn't change the accuracy very much, you know that this is not an important variable. So for the result slides, I'm just going to show histograms that rank variables like this, and you can kind of interpret what these mean. So let's start off with environmental traits. Environmental traits, some of them seem to be relatively important in terms of predicting whether or not we see isolation by distance. So things like canopy cover or whether an area is flood prone, or interestingly, whether an area contains a lot of croplands. These are all really important predictors for the environmental traits. Things like the biogeographic province, on the other hand, actually, when you take them out, the model gets better. And so we know that they're not good predictors. What about the intrinsic traits? Well, again, we have a mix. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, things like the gene use and the metabolism and the phylum of the organism end up being important predictors. Other taxonomic ranks like class end up being not as important. And so, interestingly, all of the intrinsic by environmental traits are very good predictors of isolation by distance. So things like the range area, you know, the size of the range, the maximum latitude and the minimum latitude are important. And what this suggests, I think, is nothing more than the fact that these species are all evolving in the environments that they're living in, and traits that are interacting between the environment and you know, part of the properties of these species are important predictors of isolation by distance. So after we got these results, we said, well, we really wish we had better traits. Because if we had better traits, we could make more precise inferences. So what we did is we took um, just data for mammals, and we were able to use this Pantheria database that has 55 organizable traits for all the mammal species. We repeated this analysis with about 1,000 species. And what we found was that um, the first most important trait was just the number of samples. You know, this is not super interesting. Other traits that are associated with dispersal in mammals end up having a very strong predictive ability. Again, this is just what we might expect. Lots of other traits had moderate to low predictive abilities. So in summary, I think we are, um, you know, at a point in time where we have so much data available that we're now able to think about doing larger meta-analyses. I am very lazy. I do not want to read all of these 30,000 papers and try to synthesize them. But pulling all the data down, analyzing it in a common framework will allow us to make some interesting analyses and, and learn stuff using these old data. So I would really um, like to thank all of the people in my lab and funding sources. And I don't think I have time for questions, but I will be happy to talk afterwards. Thank you.